So, <laughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ahmad Hu wa Salli ala Rasul Kareem, Amma Ba'd. Today, uh, we have a very, very important program. Um, and it's important because um, it shows you the truth about what's happening in this country. It shows you the truth about a lot of those things that the Muslim secularists who run Muslim countries that worship uh, Western society, Western ideals, we have actually a perfect person to talk about what's really happening in the inside of America and specifically what's happening inside Buffalo, which is a microcosm of the macro of America and then Western civilization in general. And so what's happening in Buffalo, what's happening uh, with, in, in the prison systems, what's happening with the minorities in America. So Brother Miles, uh, he is an excellent candidate to talk about this because he's, he's been in the inside, he's seen it all, he's very well educated, he has confronted it all. He stood up against it. Uh, he even, uh, to kind of like create a voice, uh, ran for the sheriff department uh, to become the sheriff. And he actually got a lot of votes and he gave Muslims a very good name in Buffalo. And uh, a lot of people got introduced or reintroduced to the ideas of Islam. And, uh, and he was standing up for those injustices that uh, was actually opposed, the, the justices he was standing up was against many of the uh, Muslims who are immigrants are supporting the status quo. And so that's also part of the, that brainwashing that Muslims have that colonized mind. So I'm going to, you know, and just uh, everyone's clear, uh, you know, when I talk about Buffalo and we have a Jama in Buffalo, Miles is one of the key people in it. And uh, you know, he's, he's a person who uh, is very important to us and very dear to us. So, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Brother Miles, uh, tell us about your journey, how it began. Uh, I, I, I know that I, we did that video early on where we uh, showed that whole event where the cops, the SWAT team came and uh, put you down during the demonstrations. But you know, what do you want to share about what's really happening inside Buffalo? And then, of course, that's a microcosm of what's obviously happening everywhere else. And so I want the Muslims that, like, look up to the West to think maybe it's not all that great. Yeah, no, um, there, there, there's a lot going on. And, and thank you for bringing me on the show. And it makes me feel like, like, a, uh, like an Al Jazeera correspondent uh, reporter or something like that, where it's like, now I get to report on the issues that are going on in America. Because uh, every time I watch like Al Jazeera, there's always somebody like reporting on like Jordan or uh, Iran or, you know, something like that. And it's just like, you know, so now it's my turn. And this is America, right? Um, so there, there are a lot of injustices that, uh, that occur here. Um, and, you know, people in general fail to realize the injustices that occur, um, specifically because it's injustices against, you know, impoverished people, um, and the majority of whom happen to be like black and Hispanic, right? Um, and it's it, it set up like that, you know, as a racial construct in, in our country. And just to kind of give everybody kind of like a, a brief introduction as to who I am, um, you know, my struggle is one that, you know, didn't have a start date, you know what I mean? Because it's been part of my life since I was born, you know? Um, so you talk about like, you know, drug abuse, like that's what I've experienced in the home, domestic violence, I experienced that in the home, uh, homelessness, I experienced that I was put into foster care. Um, when I was 12, I struggled through foster care, um, you know, checked out of that when I was 17 years old and went to go live on my own. I was a teenage parent, um, you know, and I did all this, you know, without faith, you know, and then I became Muslim later on in life uh, when I was 24 and I had already had two children and, and, and I was married at that time. Um, you know, so like I've, I've, I've had an opportunity to experience a lot of the issues and the struggle that happened for, for the people here, um, you know, specifically because like my family, um, you know, it's not just myself. You know, I've got six brothers and sisters. I got a mom and a dad. Um, so statistics say that we touch just about every pocket of the uh, of the poor demographic. You know, you got the one person that, you know, stayed educated and made it made it out. You've got the one that died from a drug overdose. You got the other one that spent 10 years in prison. You know, like I, my, and you know, I've got uh, you know other family members that are involved with you know, uh, uh, you know, sex work, all types of things, and you know, these are the things that affect you know poor people um, and 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 black people disproportionately. Um, but like, the, there's systemic injustices that occur, um, you know, uh, and you can kind of see that 
uh, through our criminal justice system um, because you know I, I currently serve as the imam at the Erie County Jail, um, which uh, is a lot more uh, important uh, than what I had originally thought. Um, so like an imam, like I, I, I'm sitting here thinking that, like, you know, I go in for Friday services and, you know, I, I counsel the brothers when they need. Um, but the imam is actually like the liaison between the community and the jail. Right. Um, and there are certain protections that the imam has um, that the jail cannot infringe upon. Um, you know, like I'm supposed to have unadulterated access to the uh, the prisoners. Like if there is a complaint or a violation of human rights or something along those lines, I'm supposed to be able to go in and visit them immediately. Um, so that I can report back as to what's going on inside the jails, right? Um, and and quite frequently, this this access is being denied not only for myself but for other uh, chaplains um, within the jail system. Um, you know, uh, I'm actually attending a court date tomorrow um, for one of uh, I don't know what like they they call them like parishioners here. Like if that's somebody that's in your council, as far as like you know, if you're if you're a pastor, you have a parishion. I, like, I don't really know my, one of my murids, I guess, if, if, if I'm allowed to use that word, right, to refer to myself as like, you know, but one of my students from the jail is, um, he's got court tomorrow. Um, and he's one that was involved in, uh, there was a protest that happened out at the Erie County Jail um, out in Alden, um, because they were being denied their basic human rights, um, they were being denied access to a microwave. Um, and if you've ever been in jail, um, you know that the, the way you sustain yourself is through commissary and most of that food is cooked and such through the microwaves, right? Um, so their, their microwave was taken away. They were denied that. They refer to it as a privilege as opposed to a right. Um, and that way they can erase it simply. Um, and then the, uh, the prisoners engaged in a peaceful protest, right? And while they were in the middle of this demonstration, they were locked into their units and they were not allowed to leave. Um, so like in the Erie County Jail, they have like a pod structure. It's not like individual cells. It's more of a pod. Um, so there's beds all in like a dorm type setting. Um, so they locked them in their unit. Um, you know, they didn't provide them any services or anything like that for an extended period of time. Um, and then it ended up becoming uh, uh, what they call a violent protest um, in which the inmates will tell you that they were attacked by the guards um, because they were making the guards look bad is what they were being told or, or, or something along those lines. Um, so all of this erupts, the inmates are blamed for having, you know, a, a, a riot right at the jail um, because they are peacefully protesting and demanding their rights that are guaranteed them even as as prisoners right um and they end up putting a bunch of them into solitary confinement um they refer to it as administrative segregation um but solitary confinement as you know is a violation of the eighth amendment of the constitution of the united states right it's cruel and unusual punishment um it goes against the world health organization and also united nations recommendations with respect to treating prisoners um and even prisoners of war um, it, it, it's, it's a violation of the World Health Organization and the United Nations to, to confine anybody in solitary confinement for more than, uh, I think it's uh, 15 days at a time, right? Um, so these, these, uh, these prisoners, right? And we call them political prisoners sometimes, but these prisoners were put into, uh, into solitary confinement. Um, and, and because of COVID, they're on a 23 and three quarter lockdown, right? Mm -hmm. So they get 15 minutes of outside of their cell time daily. Right, typically it's 23 and one, but it's, 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 it's confined all the way down to 23 and 15 now, uh, or 23 and 45. Um, so uh, <clears throat> they're, they're being restricted. Um, they're not getting, uh, they're not able to leave. Um, they're locked up for a period of time and then they're transferred. Um, so they're transferred from the Erie County Jail down to the Erie County Holding Center. Um, and in this transfer, uh, one of my students, Devon Cottom specifically, had uh, had made uh, uh, was was beat up pretty badly in this process, in which it looked like his hand was fractured, um, and and he his shoulder was slumped, and he uh, appeared to be in really rough shape. And this was uh, this was about a week after the transfer. Right? So just let me interject and ask Miles: Do events like this happen in America every day, every week? every day, every day? You know, America is so big, you know, and, and the, the, the jail system that we have here in Buffalo, and this is what you said, it, this is a microcosm of what we experience on a macro level, because it's like, you know, our jail system is representative of the same jail system that every community in America has, because that's what we do is we duplicate the communities over mm -hmm. and over again until we have yeah, a complete like a America. Cutter. Yeah, 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 it's a cookie cutter, right? So we got every, every city, every county is constructed the same. They have police force. They've got a sheriff's department. The sheriff's in control of the jails, right? And the jails are a reflection of like, if you look at um, St. Louis, St. Louis is going through issues with their jail system. California has been going through issues with their jail system. Um, you know, and you've got several other cities uh, all over the, or 
Portland, Oregon, the reason why they erupted in protests and, and demonstrations last year, large in part, was because of their jail system, right? And, mm. and the inequities and injustice that occur there, right? And and the the distraction is these national headlines, um, you know, and, and the inability for people to connect those national headlines to what's going on on a local level, mm. right? Because it's like when you start peeling back the layers, you you see that George Floyd didn't just happen in, in Minnesota. You know what I mean? Like George Floyd is like, I've got six examples of George Floyd right here in Buffalo that right, I can give right, you. Right. You know what I mean? Including a yeah. police officer who broke up a uh, 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 illegal chokehold. That's the same one that was being performed or very similar to the one that was being performed on George Floyd uh, in his death. And she was fired from her job, stripped of her pension right. I and, remember and, that. Yeah. and attemptedly criminally charged uh, by the Buffalo police department. Right. So it's like, uh, you know, we've got all this stuff that exists. So this on is such a very a good level. example of what happened with Prophet Musa. So kind of like to put it in the Quranic paradigm, you have the Kipti tribe, the Fir'aun's tribe, and then you have Bani Israel, right? And the Bani Israel are being killed. And the Quran uses the words over and over again, Yaktununa abna'ahum, they would kill their men, nisa'ahum, and let their women live, right? And so when anyone's looking at the civilization at that time, they would only look at the elite. They would look at the Kipti tribe. They would not see what that tribe is doing to other minorities right. within their area. And if you and that's what the Quran is pointing out. Look at what you did to the the even though they were very large in population, but they were being controlled and they were killed. And the African American community, for example, not only that, but even if you look at the uh, American Indian community. Uh, it's pretty clear for those two, maybe for the Mexicans also, but uh, but for the African American community, it's very clear that they're killing off the men, and then they, you know, and then they let the women live and give them the job so that the man that the men are not husband material. Oh yeah, I mean we can unpack so much with that. I mean like the 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 fact that the black community in Buffalo or in in America is the only community in which the women are out earning the men um, is, is very telling on on the attack against black men specifically. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and this is this is the reality, because, you know, when you talk about oppression and systemic oppression, like, you know, the 13th Amendment, which is uh, uh, accredited for the liberation of Africans from slavery was actually, you know, it, it, it didn't end slavery, it transitioned slavery into the criminal justice system. Right. Mm -hmm. And then and then through that, there's a systemic attempt throughout uh, uh, throughout all facets of America to continue to funnel black men into that criminal justice system so that we can continue to be enslaved, right? And people don't see it. Like it, it's, it's through media, um, it's through social grooming, um, it's through education, um, it's through the lack of jobs, it's through community spending, um, the lack of proper tax re uh, 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 representation within communities. Um, for instance, you know, black people pay just as much taxes as white people, but we get a less of a return when it comes to community spending. Uh, like community centers, like garbage cleaning, like uh, uh, all types of yeah, things. Yeah, general sanitation. <laughs> right. So it's like, you know, all, all of these things combined kind of like, you know, represent the systemic attempt to shovel black people into the criminal justice system. And it's like, you know, I've, I've been at the jails now for the past, uh, uh, since I was 28 now, so the past three years. And, um, you know, large in part, you know, 90% of my jama in the jail is, is, is black. Mm hmm you know, and, and it's, so, it's and even though black are less, maybe part of the overall population, but they're more in jail. Right. And then, and then I think the other thing that's yeah, very, we, 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 we represent, I believe it's 18% of the population on like a number level. And then we represent 50% of the prison population hmm. or 35% of the prison or 40%. It's, it's something ridiculous number. It's like double our, our digits in the prison population. Hmm. Right. And then, and then the other portion is the, the other leader is the Hispanic community in the prison. Hmm population which is also mm. black right what i find interesting about african americans and hispanic is that they're both lost brothers and sisters of islam because spain used to be muslim right and and then you know after the spanish inquisition they were forced into christianity and then of course many of the african americans that came from west africa were muslims before they were here and anyway, so well, part of the reason uh, for Spain's olive skin tone is because of not only the Mediterranean, but the African influence mm -hmm. um, that that came through, you know, the conquering, like, I, I believe it was the Moors that conquered like Spain and, and, and Southern Europe there. Yep. Right. And, and a lot of that was, you know, mixing in. It wasn't just the fact that they're closer to the sun. Yeah, <laughs> right. 
And so, uh, you know, also what's uh, very apparent for anybody that lives in the US, and I think this would be true about England or some of the other Western countries, and even in Muslim countries, it's there, but there's a very uh, intentional, you can say, you know, the rich people are here and you cross the street or you cross the bridge and then here's where the poor people are. Well, you live in Buffalo, right. you see that here. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, it's very clear, you know, right. and and so it's like, uh, over here, you, you more taxes are going into whatever the utilities are, and over here, you know, it's 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 like not a good situation at all. And right. so, well, we we just had like, for instance, there's a uh, there's a, a black rapper from Buffalo. Um, what, what's his name? The the rapper from Buffalo, the one that just had the concert on Hurdle. Oh, um, Griselda. Yeah, his name is Griselda, right? So there's a black rapper from Buffalo named Griselda. And, uh, you know, he he's supposed to represent, you know, Black Buffalo or what have you. And, and he's done quite a few shows for the uh, for the mayor and everything else. And it's like they had a whole uh, concert with him on 716 day. Right. Because that's Buffalo's area code. So on July 16th, we had a concert. Right. And they put that concert up in North Buffalo on Hurdle, which is a predominantly white community. Right. And I went there and it's like, you know, there was predominantly white people there. And it's like, you know, this is a, this is a black rapper that's supposed to represent black people in Buffalo. Uh, uh, West Side Gun is, is is specifically who it was. You know, why wasn't the concert over on Delavan or on Genesee Street or on Broadway, which is the areas, you know, the impoverished black areas, right mm -hmm. on the east side of Buffalo? Um, you know, that would have been like more representative of of you know, kind of him, you know, his cause, our people, and even the mayor of the city. You know, being a black person who's supposed to represent, you know, um, um, the community. But, uh, an another uh, concept that Muslims, especially in the Muslim countries like Pakistan and Egypt, they have that, you know, democracy is very fair in America. And I know you went through the whole electoral process. Uh, so, you know, we understand, okay, you know, uh, they're not nice to minorities and right. they're not nice to the black people. And there is a systemic problem. Right. Well, there's no easy access to politics in, in, in America. Right. And I think that that's the common misconception is that you just, you know, for one, if you want to run for an office, you just put your hand up and say, I want to run for office. Yeah. That's not how it works. Right. And even if you want to vote, you don't just walk into a, a polling place and vote. You know, there's a whole process to that even. But like, you know, there's like, you know, outside of the actual face of politics, there's a whole machine behind it. Right. So you have like the Democrats and Republicans are like the uh, the, the the two major parties within the yeah, I call it the two party dictatorship. Right. It's a two party dictatorship. Right. And, and they, they agree on everything except except what a few things, <laughs> except for uh, except uh, mass minority. incarceration, yeah. police brutality and war. <laughs> right? Or those I mean, th those are all the things they agree on. Right. And then it's like the, the, the list of things they actually disagree on is very small. But um, but nonetheless, like we have this two party system that that controls, you know, pretty much everything. And those two party systems, they have a whole back door. Um, what they have to access and, and in order also, to even be. If you can also clarify party. because I've been told this by other people. It's almost impossible to run independently. It's like you have to be part of one of the two machines. Unless you're extremely popular, you know, uh, because it's all about name recognition, right? Because most people, um, you know, uh, in America, they they identify with a party and they and they vote down party lines, right? And then you have a, a part of the population that's independent that will vote based on. Uh, based on the actual person and their platform and what have you. Um, but most people that identify as Democrat will typically vote all the way Democrat. Most people that identify as Republican will vote all the way Republican, right? And before, the, the thing is, is that all the, the people and the decisions are typically made by the time we get to go in and vote, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's large in part symbolic, the fact that we're marking, you know, in these, in, on these boxes, right? And like places like the city of Buffalo, um, that is like I th like it's a, an insane number of registered Democrats, right? And mm. that always votes Democrat. It's like if you're not part of like the uh, electoral committee, you know, in the uh, in the in the Democratic Party, you really don't even have a say of who gets elected into office, mm. right? Because those decisions are made by like I think it's like 20 people behind closed doors down at the uh, at the Democratic committee, right? Mm. Because Democrats are going to win every single time because of the the uh, the the uh the makeup of the city politically mm -hmm. right so you have yeah, to be so a committee the people member have been in office for a very long time they already know every because you were talking to me about one day how easy it is to eliminate people if they make one mistake you know you have to start the whole process over again like for example getting the signatures right uh, and and somebody who's been in office already knows all that and so you have 
a father and then his son takes his place and it's literally like that local level it, it, it's not even it's not even the father so it's, it, there's a machine right and the machine is programmed to be able to produce the same results every single time right but it's like so it's like it knows how many signatures that they need to to get on the ballot it knows how many people need to vote for them in order to win the primary it knows how many people need to vote for them in order to win the general election Right. And it already has all the predictive analysis done and it's got all the hard work done. So all you have to do is go and be part of the machine. Right. And 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 wait and turn in line or 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 lobby for a higher position in order to get pushed into those those positions that we elect people into. Mm. Right. And and I say elect because it gets, it's it's not an election. Right. We, right. we are right. going out and voting. But it's it's already determined by the time we get there because of the the makeup of our city, and it's like this in most places throughout America. Yeah, right. It, I mean, like in Chicago, you, it's been like the grandfather, father, son, the same yeah. thing been there. And yeah, so, if if, uh, if, if in, in in for instance, if you go to uh, certain places in California, Oakland, California, right, it's been a democratic city probably for the past sixty years. Yeah. Right. Take a look at like you know Houston, Texas. It's probably been Republican since the creation of time. Right. Yeah. And, and it's like, as long as you're in with the Republican Party and you get pushed into those, because there's only one Republican line on the ballot. Right. There's only one Democratic line on the ballot. Right. So it's like you, you have to be in with those parties before the election in order to make sure that you're in there. And it's like, you know, the change makers aren't in with those parties. Right. And then the people that want to stand up for justice get divided into people that want justice, but want to compromise people that want justice, but want to make a slow change. And there are very right. few people like Malcolm X or even Martin Luther King that are like kind of like actually radical. In, in well, well I, I think like uh, and this is this is what Malcolm X was killed for. Right. Is, is this idea of black unity. Right. Mm -hmm. This whole time where he's talking about grabbing arms and doing this and and making sure we're well protected. They left him alone. Nobody shot him. No, like as soon as he talked about black unity. Right. And 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 crossing religious barriers and, and, and crossing socioeconomic barriers and crossing thought barriers and supporting and supporting each other for being black and, and working on creating a black base. That that's when they decided that it was time to kill him, you know, because, you know, at that point um, that I think that that was the true knowledge that they didn't want him to gain. Right. So it's like when it comes to the people that are willing to negotiate and make compromise versus the people that are radicals versus the people that are work on slow change versus the people that are like the black bourgeoisie. You know what I mean? That um, that don't have to participate in this process because they are able to participate with their finances. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's like, you know, that like we all have to work together. Right. In order to accomplish what needs to be done. You know, right. and and over here, I just want to put one point, which is that. Muslims have to be at the forefront of that change that's radical so that people understand what Islam is about. Otherwise, it's just theory. Yeah, well, you, you see, it's always Muslims at the forefront of radical change. That's why they call us terrorists, right? Is because it's like, you know, when we when we go against what they're trying to shove down our throats, then it's then it's terrorizing their system. Right. right. And it's like and, 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 and we understand that the type of subjugation that people are receiving in the jails is, is not only un-Islamic, you know, but Islam is humanity. So it's it's, it's inhumane. Right. And it's like we're we're commanded to speak up for these things. Right. So it's like, you know, we have to. We have to. And yes, like there's there's a lot of us that don't, but there's a few of us that do like and, and it's it's surprising uh, for me because so many people that I met throughout this process where they're not visibly Muslim, they are Muslim. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Um, so like this this one uh, woman that was working on my campaign, um, you know, she. Uh, she she wasn't visibly Muslim to me when I met her. You know what I mean? She's she's not wearing you know sleeves to come down to her wrist. She's not wearing hijab. You know what I mean? Um, but she gave me salam. You know what I mean? So it's like, uh, and then I found out that she's from Morocco, and it's oh, like, wow. and 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 she's one of the leaders in this movement. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? And it's like even with the political stuff, you know, there's another person that does a lot of the the footwork for the politicians and, and pushing out the literature and the agendas and stuff like that. And he's built a company on it, you know, um, not visibly Muslim, but he's a Muslim. Um, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And and I found that out later in, in speaking with him and, and everything. It's like there there's tons of Muslims that are involved in the movement. And, and um, conversely, there's a lot of Muslims who have beards go to the mosque. And they support the machine that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 an interesting one because it's like they, uh, 
you know, you there are certain groups of, of Muslims that you're just they're like, like oh, with no, their own thinking that they're doing the right thing, giving Muslims a good name with their own, and they don't care about the injustices that are being done on the bottom. Who would actually benefit from Islam, not the Pharaonic, uh, right. the Pharaonic structure? Well, I think what they fail to do is realize the evil that's contained within the system, or even if they do realize it, because it's 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 difficult not to realize it once you've once you've submerged yourself. You know what I mean? Once you're in it, you you start to realize quickly all of the things that are wrong with it and all the injustices that are occurring. And it's very easy to say this isn't right. Um, but the thing is, is that people benefit off of it quite frequently. So they're willing to not only turn a blind eye, but they're willing to be uh, complicit and even supportive in a lot of the actions of, of you know, there, there's there's black police officers, you know, mm. and 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 at times these black police officers are worse to the black community than the white police officers are. It's called self-hate. Yeah. You know, there, there's there's Muslim police officers. Yeah. And I'm investigating a, a, a case of police brutality against a Muslim police officer right now. Mm. You know what I mean? And 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 his family's prominent in the Muslim community, hmm. so it's not like he's a stray. Hmm. You know, it's like you, the 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 power is corrupting, right? And and yeah, and the quite powers. often, you know, us Muslims aren't protected from it the same way black people aren't protected from it the same way white people are benefiting from it. Do you know what Malcolm X said about the difference between the the house slave versus the field slave? So Malcolm X said, you know, that the house slave is the slave inside the house, right? He has He's inside the house. So the field slave is the is the slaves working in the field. And the house slave, when he says, Malcolm X says, when the house, the master of the house is sick, the house slave says, we sick master, you know. And so he identifies himself with the master. And right. he looks down on the field slaves. And you see, when you have it made a little bit, even if you're black and you got a little bit made, you start right. identifying with the 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 right. system that's what Malcolm X, when they when when they went and to so, war like and oh so you we're have going Muslims to war and talking about are, Vietnam Muslims who are colonized and they're working yeah. with you know the system then they'll be like oh you know what the system is but you know this right. colonization this colonization occurred before most of you guys even got to America right because you're yeah, coming exactly. from pre-colonized lands yeah. Yeah. right why like most Indians are coming here speaking English already you know what I mean? So many, so many Pakistanis and Bengalis are coming here speaking English already because those are pre-colonized lands, and mm. and they're coming here with already this programmed uh, mindset that, that white it's is very right. good here. This is Jannah. It's like yeah, the, the, that that yep. white is right, and and that when when these politicians and police officers say something that it that it means you know, and it's uh, they, they get caught up very quickly um, in in the facade, right? Because right, and, they, and and what they see is America is very clean, America is very orderly. America follows the rules of law, you know, they don't know the reality. It's just, I mean, I, like, I've been to third world countries that are cleaner than America. I like, I really have, like, I've lived in Buffalo my entire life. I've been to probably about 30 States throughout this country. Um, I, I have a pretty good grasp of what this country looks like. I've been to third world countries that are in better shape, like physically and, and like, even like cleanliness, uh, than America. Like, you know, you, you go through like places like, like Flint, Michigan, you're dealing with lead pipes that are poisoning people. Like they're, they're drinking water's coming out yellow, yeah. you know, and that's happening in Buffalo too. We don't even talk about it in Buffalo, you know, because we've got filters in place that, that change the color of the water before it gets to the tap. But we've got just as much lead in our water here as they do in, in, in Flint. Like we've got cities and buildings that are falling apart. You know what I mean? Like we've got roads and bridges that are collapsing. Like we just had a, a, a condo collapse in Miami, uh, uh, what, two months ago, right? Yeah. An entire condo. And then a week later, uh, another another uh, building collapsed in Buffalo, right? It's like you know, we we've got rundown infrastructure. We've got an overpopulation or an oversized jail population. We've got the leading population in jail in the entire world, right? Right. America been, has the most prisoners in the world. Yeah, we have the 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 largest war budget in the world in comparison to the next five countries combined, right? Mm -hmm. It's like if if you put our 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 jail population together, it would be like the 18th largest country in the world. Mm -hmm. Like it's like the like the numbers are staggering when you start to really look and like it's not just jail like we don't just have people in prison we have people on probation which means that they have uh, supervision outside of jail 
You have people on parole, which is uh, uh, which is post release supervision, right? You have people on the sex offender list, which is lifelong supervision. Like you have all types of different levels of of enforcement. You have people in foster care. Like we don't equate foster care to being in jail, but you get the same type of supervision in foster care that you do in, in jail in, in in on on probation. Like you go to court regularly, you have a caseworker regularly that's checking in on you. You're very easy and apt to end up in uh, in a secure detentional facility. Um, because they're monitoring your behavior closely. Um, you know what I mean? Like, and there's different levels of even being in foster care. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's group homes here um, where the group homes here are very similar to those, those Native American homes that you're seeing in, in popping up in Canada with, with burial graves outside of hundreds of dead kids, thousands of dead kids. Like we've got group homes here for not even just Native Americans, but for black kids here, just like that, because there is an attempt to strip us out of our homes, to colonize our minds, to, to, to drain us of our culture that, that we've gotten even after it's been stripped from us, do you know? Um, so it's like, there, there's a continuation of, of, of the oppression even outside of jail. And it's like, uh, if, if like, I, it's, it's, it's difficult to say, but you just look at it and it's like, uh, and it's like you said, it's propagated on, on every single level. It's, it's, it starts off in Buffalo, it's on the county levels, on a state level. It's on. It's in Rochester. It's in Miami. It's in Chicago. Are politicians corrupt in America? Yeah, for sure. Politicians are corrupt, and 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 the reason is is because like there, there's there's money involved in politics. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Money um, yeah. Yeah. So so a, a huge part to to winning your campaign is making sure that you've got the funds and finances to outspend your competitor. Right. And, and the way to get those funds and finances to outspend your competitors by making promises to people that have the money. Mm. Right. So a lot of times you see real estate developers uh, winning uh, over politicians. Um, you see uh, unions like the police union having heavy influence over politicians because they've got uh, uh, money to, to donate and votes to throw behind. Um, you, you, you see like these, these large swaths of influence coming from, you know, if Walmart wants to open up a, a, a store in your town and, and, and threaten 12 businesses, you know, a pharmacy, uh, um, you know, a, a dog store, you know, all they yeah, have to do is make a, a $50,000 donation to your, 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 your congressman and they can get in without a problem. Right, right. So here's a, you know, mama pop middle class store, 10 of them. I remember uh, one of my teachers who used to make computers and sell them, right? And so he hires somebody $10, whatever, an hour, and then they make the computer. And now he's going to sell the computer at, you know, some price. But now they can go to Best Buy and get a loan and get the same computer for $20 a month. So how is he going to sell his computer, right? Yeah. And so... And and so and then even half um, you know, half the population that's even working in Walmart they also need welfare on top of what they're because it's not enough exactly and that that's that's the other part that people fail to realize is that like the because of Walmart right because of Target because of these places like this is what's perpetuating the poverty in our communities because they they've stripped down these these hundred thousand dollar jobs these hundred thousand dollar businesses these fifty thousand dollar a year careers and replace them with ten to twelve dollar an hour jobs right and and this is what perpetuates poverty right it's when it's it's but again this is this stuff is manufactured because when you go to specific communities they do not allow Walmart in they do not allow family dollar in. They do not allow a dollar general in because mm. they recommend they they recognize the implications that that has for their community, right? And they and and unfortunately, it's us that lose mo- more often. Like if you drive through the city of Buffalo, you will see a family dollar and a dollar general, both family dollar and dollar general, competing on every single major street throughout the city of Buffalo. Yeah, I mean it's almost like every few blocks, every right. And and blocks. and and you know they got us worried about whether or not these corner stores owned by Arabs are threatening the black community. All the while, these multi-billion dollar corporations controlled by white men are threatening the black community. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's bad both ways. Right? It's bad both well, ways, but at, Muslims, at, at least the Arab yeah. lives close. <laughs> yeah, and so because I want to actually come to that. When you live in the community. That's, that's an important topic that we need to touch when it comes to Muslims. Um, and so, okay, so let's talk about that, and then I'll talk about this other issue. So Muslims... And I've heard this in Chicago, and I'm, I'm seeing this in, in Buffalo, that Muslims will open up stores in African-American communities, live themselves in the suburbs, right? And not hire anybody of the local community, right? Meaning you're not, they're not interested in building a relationship, introducing Islam 
uh, a business is such a good opportunity to introduce people to Islam, but they don't take it that way. I, I think the big thing that we have to do is stop people and, and let them know that it's not the religion of Islam that is taking advantage of people. Mm. Um, right. And if, if, if it's anything, it, it's going to be a specific group of people that are coming in. <clears throat> you know, if we, if we want to label them, it's whatever group they are. Right. And it's like, like if it's gentrifying because you know, in, in the city of Buffalo, it's not the Arabs buying up the east side of Buffalo. It's the Indo-Pak community buying up the east side of Buffalo. The Arabs have the stores and they live in Lackawanna. Right. You know what right. I mean? Or they live in Amherst. Right. Yeah. And it's not to kind of segregate people. It's just to kind of speak the truth. So it's like, you know, um, and those that Indo-Pak community, while large in part Muslim, they are not representative of Islam. Right. They're 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 just Muslims. Right. Those yeah, but the average African-American who is uh, uh, paying rent to a Muslim who owns, let's say, a house doesn't right right well they know as an outsider they're, is... they're, they're looking at muslim like it's a like it's a whole like it's like it's a race you know what i mean like anybody that wears that hat is now the one that's responsible for all of those issues that are being propagated because they have a a a, a slumlord and in reality they're they have a slumlord that just moved her from a third world country and bought a house that they couldn't afford and can't maintain the upkeep and don't really have a have a need to because they're used to living in slum conditions themselves because they came from a country that had running sewage outside of their house yeah and and then uh, but but the other side but a lot of these people especially the landlords they themselves live in the suburbs and by living in the suburbs when they do come into the cities they look down on the people in the city yeah yeah. Well, I, I've definitely uh, been an interaction because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm light skinned. So when people look at me, they don't often, well, Muslims specifically, they always try and figure out what I am, like if I'm Arab or something like that, because of the complexion of my skin. So it's like, they feel comfortable saying things to me sometimes. And I was doing a home inspection and the one property manager said, um, you know, oh, don't ever rent your house to Africans. Mm -hmm. They'll never treat it right. You know, because they're just used to living in ghetto slum conditions. And like, I had, to, I had to correct him on the spot, but it's like, you know, though, that's the thought, but it's, it's the colonized mindset, you know, and, and Sheikh Omar, you're, you're from, you're from India, right? Pakistan. Pakistan, sorry. Genetically. Yeah. Genetically, Genetically from Pakistan. Right. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're Pakistani and it's like, uh, uh, that, that whole subcontinent, right. Was colonized. Yeah. By, I mean, by the totally British. British. Right. Totally so so with that colonization also comes the discrimination, right? And the superiority uh, complex that you guys even face with yourselves, right? Yeah. Because if, a, if, if an Indian or Pakistani person is, is, is faced with the opportunity to marry a white person versus somebody of their own culture, how often are they going to choose the white person? Yeah, it's happening all the time, every day. Right. It's, it's because the white people are on a pedestal to you guys because of the colonization mindset. We have that same thing here. So I'm not even trying to say that that's a problem for y'all. That's a problem for all of us that we have to break out of because that that's that's white supremacy. Right. And that's the superiority that's been pushed down our throats. And, it's and, you know, and it's it's controlled through our history books. You know what I mean? It's controlled through television. You know, if you look at TV, um, you know, the, the Indian girl is always the, uh, the the pretty girl from high school that the white guy might fall in love with. You know, the black guy is always the drug dealer. Um, you know, or, or, or the gangbanger, um, you know, he might look up and get a nerdy black role every once in a while, right? The, uh, the, the woman is always conflicted with some type up. of issue. You know, it's like the, 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 the portrayal of, of cultural like norms through, through like, through media is so much responsible for how people perceive the world. And it's like crazy, because I'm still having conversations with people that don't think like the sexualization of children exists. Right? Yes, definitely. Human trafficking is a big issue. Yeah, but we don't even talk about it, right? Because yeah, we're, I mean, we're, we're focused on whether Kylie Jenner's lips are real and whether the lipstick makes them bigger or not, right? Because that's, <laughs> that's, that's the distractions that we're faced with. Yes, yeah, subhanAllah. And so uh, do you ever think about how, you know, as you're talking to people and you're interacting with people and you're seeing these injustices and... Do you ever feel like I wish they knew Islam? Like I wish they, that we could impose Islamic solutions uh, on some of these issues. Uh, you know, do you have something to say about that? Hundred um, percent. You know, there's part of my platform even while running for sheriff is like there's an issue of rape and sexual assault that exists within the jails, hmm. right? And and quite often it's coming from the guards down to the uh, the inmates, and and women are leaving the jails pregnant. Right. And it's like, you know, this is like this is abuse of power. 
Mm -hmm. right? And, and a simple Islamic solution, right, to, to fixing this problem, right, a solution to this problem is just having the men in the male in, in the male section of the jail and having the women in the women's section of the jail. Oh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Simple Islamic solution, right? And and like that's, you know, and then there's also things like restorative justice, right? Restorative justice gets this huge like rep for being, you know, the uh, uh, the savior to the criminal justice system. But restorative justice has been practiced in Islam um, in every a hadith that I've read, you know, with respect to like, you know, judges and in a courtship is like the the accused stands there and says what will satisfy or the, no, the the victim will say what satisfies, you know, the crime has been committed against them. Mm. Right. You know, what makes you feel whole? What restores you? Right. Is it blood money? Right. Is it is it the death of this person? Right. Is it forgiving them with no consequences? Do you know yeah. what I mean? And it's like, you know, that. Like Over here, that, what happens is, first of all, you go to jail, then yeah. you can't get a job because you, it's now part of your uh, history, and it follows you for the rest of your life. And so the system is set up so that if you're African American or Hispanic or any minority, and after one or two generations, it's even Muslims, right? Like in Michigan, for example, right? So if you mess up any time in your life and you end up in jail, like in Islam, it's like you punish them and then that's it, right? people talk about the harshness of Islamic punishments, but you you slash someone or you whip somebody 10 times, 20 times, that's it. They're done. There's no, it's, it's not going to affect your job. It's not going to affect your, you know, employment history. It's not going to affect you in any other way other than the fact you did it. Your toba was done from a legal right. perspective. And even in a Sharia people, perspective, you still get access to Jannah and you've been rectified of your sins. Only. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like, uh, yeah. The restorative yeah, I mean, justice process is is like that is the epitome of what we should be looking at when it comes to uh, instituting a real criminal justice system, hmm. right? Because justice isn't what a third party sees as 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 punishment or reward or or what have you. Justice is what the affected parties see as you know, and and what's been prescribed by actual law. And and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has been gracious enough to give us like to prescribe punishments for so many things that if we do wrong, you know what I mean. Like we have the prescribed punishment that if we're found guilty for a murder that, you know, we can have up to and including, you know, your death for that murder, hmm. you know, and that's, I, I think that that's like, you know, there, there, there has to be a, a system in which we can all agree on. Like, this is, this is how things can operate. Um, the prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in one of the narrations that when rich people uh, get away from crimes and then the poor people are blamed for that, meaning if a rich person did a crime, and then a poor person did a crime, they'll catch the poor person and uh, then let go of the rich people and that type of culture. Do you see that type of culture in America now? Yes. I mean, it's, 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 it's wholly evident. I can, I can show you a documentary that was done in Detroit where you have uh, 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 the police are supplying guns to white distributors who are then selling them to uh, black people in the streets illegally and then turning around and supplying those names back to the police that they bought the guns off of. <laughs> right. Um, I can like, you know, there's a, a, a huge fentanyl uh, overdose uh, uh, thing happening in America now, specifically happening in Buffalo. And fentanyl, fentanyl is a medical grade uh, opioid. You know what mm. I mean? Um, mm. Your local street dealers don't have access to medical grade opioids. Right. This is a distribution level problem. This is a rich people problem. Right. But we're not going after distributors. We're going after after street dealers. Right. We're not going mm. after arms distributors. We're going after shooters in the streets. Right. So these these are issues that are perpetuated by by rich people. Right. Where 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 Caucasian people specifically, I, I believe, are making a lot of money. Um, but but black people are, are, you know, the ones that are picking up the penalties for those crimes. You know, um, you know, crack is something that's made out of cocaine. But how many black people have the ability to fly to Colombia to pick up cocaine and fly it back to America? Yeah, I'm sure you know about this, but I'm saying it because the viewers will not know. But, you know, you know how we go on our Sunnah walks sometimes after, yeah, after yeah, Isha, yeah. security after walks. Isha, yeah. After Isha, we go on the Sunnah walks where, you know, we go around the neighborhood saying salams to whoever. And a lot of our neighborhood is Muslims and the people that are not Muslims. We just want to be nice to them, talk to them. Anyway, me and one day uh, a group of us, uh, one of the sheikhs, you know, uh, we were going to actually it was me and him together. And, and you heard about this, right? When we, we heard from one of the windows, a Muslim, a Muslim lady was screaming from the, from the window mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that, uh, you know, uh, I, help. She was saying, help, help. 
from 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 the window. We heard it. I heard it. The sheikh heard it. Uh, other people heard it. And uh, and and then we're like, what? Show? So we called the cops, right? And the cops they they didn't come the first time we called. They come. They came the third time we called after eighteen minutes. And uh, it was nonchalant. It's like, yeah, we can't really do anything, you know, whatever. And and so it's it's like. That was like a really interesting experience for me because, you know, I understand it's the pandemic and it's all this, but seriously, if you tell somebody there's a woman inside crying for help and you're not going to help her, what's, I mean, that's like the verse of the Quran. And, and I, I, I can tell you a, 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 a similar story where a black man was held in jail for a week because the neighbor called and said that he had a gun in his house. So oh. they, 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 they went and searched his house right they they obtained a, a, an immediate search warrant searched his house and found a broken gun right and uh, but they were able to do this immediate search because they got a call a tip from a neighbor right that a black man had a gun in the house right but yeah. yet you hear a woman screaming for help inside of a house what what steps did it take to 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 uh to solve or to to help that situation no, the, the, the cops did nothing we did a few things to let the brother know that we know what's going on and right and then you know whatever but the point is, is that uh, there's there's such deep, dark level of injustices taking place. And like another example that I'll share with you, I know you know this, but in, in our neighborhood over here, what the, the 10 mile radius, we know, and the cops know, we all know where crimes are taking place, who's selling what, who's doing what. Everyone knows this, but the cops are not gonna go to many of those places and arrest those people. It, somehow they're okay with things just continuing in black neighborhoods negatively, you know, and there was something you said about property that a lot of it comes down to property. Remember that conversation? We yeah. Had? Well, that, that, that's, that's Huey Newton, right? Is, is that, that the police are here to protect property, right? Property, not people. And if the people don't own any property, then they're not there for the, for those people. Right. So it's like, you know, the, the, you, your, your protection is limited when you're not an actual owner of, of your, of your home, of your business, of your community, right. Because you're not considered to be a full participator. Right. So even if you look at the constitution, the constitution is geared towards white land owning men. Mm, yeah. Right. Land. Even when it's is talking like, about, you know, the right to bear arms, who had arms. Right. You know, it's, it's, to have all arms. of it is geared towards landowners because it had such a huge emphasis on, on, uh, on owning and entrepreneurship. Right. Mm. Um, so it's like, you know, when we're not owning, we're limiting ourselves. Right. And, and even our social security number is like, it's an enslavement stamp. Right. Yeah, and, sure. and, and, and our responsibility, that's, our job, that's a whole different conversation. Right? Our but, job is yeah, our responsibility yeah. is to separate ourselves from that stamp and become the owner of that social security number, as opposed to the actual owned of that social security number. Right. right? Yeah. And it's like, you know, these are all things that we have to educate ourselves on to figure that out. But, uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. As soon as you're born. You know, they, they, they used to not give you a social security number as soon as you're born. But nowadays, this minute you're born, you get a social security number now. And basically the social security number. Right. There, there's a few your, groups that can opt out. Enslavement stamp. Um, so I, 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 I believe Native Americans can opt out. And then like the, uh, the Amish or, or, or Mennonite uh, community can opt out as well. So mm -hmm. and, and we do have we do have the option to opt out of a, of a social security number, but it's extremely limiting. Um, because you need either a social security number or a tax ID number to pretty much do anything um, in this And country. also to get your social security once you retire. <laughs> right, right. So you to, if you need it, if you need it. Quite right. honestly, like that social security, um, you know, it might not even be available for most of us that are paying into it now. Uh, how often do cops uh, not follow the book or don't follow the like procedures that are in the book? And you know, on paper, it might look okay, but then, because I've seen so many cases. I'm considered to be a problem because I educate the police officers when they're not following law, right? And <laughs> when it comes to me specifically, like, and, and, and like, I've probably like 70%, 60 to 70% of the instances that I've come across where police don't properly know or apply the law. Um, you know, and if you, and if you ask some questions about the constitution um, and specific amendments, like, most people don't know that. And like, this is, this is law enforcement. And, and so much of our law comes from the constitution that if they just had knowledge of the constitution and proper application of that, they wouldn't have to know penal code 6379 of, of Tano Tanawanda or the city of Buffalo ordinance. You know what I mean? Most of it would just be like, you know, don't infringe upon people's freedoms, um, which is what the, the, the thing they break uh, most frequently. 
um, you know, uh, for, for us specifically is illegal search and seizure. Um, mm. I know three people right now that have uh, cases against Buffalo police uh, for uh, uh, manufactured evidence. Um, and they can claim me manufactured evidence because the evidence was illegally obtained. Right. I, so, I, I've so. seen that myself personally. I yeah. was once stopped and uh, I had to, I was invited somewhere to speak and on the way I got pulled over and, you know, for whatever reason, the cop actually, for no reason at all, handcuffed me, put me in the back of his uh, police car, searched my entire car inside out, searched my entire car inside out, and then brought something. And I've never done drugs in my life, like ever. So, and he says, what's this bottle? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know no bottle. <laughs> so... And, and, and I was like, just so you're clear, I'm, I'm like a, you know, a pastor and uh, I haven't ever done drugs and I'm a Muslim and Muslims never do drugs. So if you're trying to put that on me, that's just not going to fly because I'm going to get a hair test done and that's right. going to show that you're wrong. And so, so then, then after I said that he let me go, maybe some du'as also helped me, but Mashallah. you know. So, so the point is, is that, yeah, I mean, he like ripped my car apart. So when they, and you know, well, this, got, was in, clause, this was, in, by the way, this was, in, this was in, this was in, this was in Iowa. So, you Four know, country. very white. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. so I got pulled over in Iowa and it was like, uh, can you please uh, get out of the car, sir? I was like, what did I do? <laughs> yeah. Well, there, so, there's a clause in the law that's called reasonable suspicion. Right. So under reasonable suspicion, um, and this is this is in the amendment, I forget which number amendment it, it deals with uh, 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 search and seizure. Um, but uh, reasonable suspicion uh, gives them to uh, vacate the uh, vacate the constitutional protection. Right. So like, uh, for instance, marijuana was a schedule one drug in 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 New York state. So if you got pulled over, and this is one that was quite frequently used against black people, right? And it's because you don't have to see the weed, you don't have to hear the weed, you don't. The only thing that you have to smell the weed. If you smell the weed, you've got enough. You've got enough suspicion to then uh, to then go in and search the vehicle, right? Mm. Uh, now, now weed legally is no longer uh, 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 a reason for reasonable suspicion, right? But this was used quite frequently before. Um, so, so that's like a way to kind of vacate that, that, that constitutional protection is if they believe that you're going to harm somebody, if they believe that you have drugs because they can smell it, if they can hear a screaming child, which is why they should have been able to help in that situation. Right. It, then, then they're able oh, which to vacate. Reminds me, it wasn't just the mother. It was also the daughter. Yeah. Senior. So it's like, you know, there, there's, there's a clause in that amendment that refers to a reasonable suspicion. Right. And this is quite frequently used to, uh, uh, to, to lock up black people, right. Or to search black people or to enter a black person's home, right, is reasonable suspicion. Um, but they don't quite often apply that, say, or, you know, it's not applicable, you know, towards other people. And it's, it's, it's kind of strange. The other thing I've noticed, and I don't know what you have to say about this, is that there's a big difference between cops of the previous generation and the cops now. They seem worse or more, um, I guess, immature, more prone to... That's society, though, right? That's it's just like funny. they're growing with society, right? Yeah. Or, or you know, and that's just how it is. But you you look at the budget, right? And the budget will really be the the indicator of the relationship that that community has with the police, right? A community with a larger police budget means that that police has a looming that 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 police department has a looming uh, uh, presence in the community, hmm. right? A, a a community with a smaller police department typically has a really good relationship with their police. That's true, uh, actually. Yeah. Right. So, okay. like in the town of Amherst, um, you know, a very safe community, very white community, right? They spend uh, uh, six million dollars a year on the police department, and that's for a population of one hundred eighty thousand people, and uh, that's roughly like three quarters the size of Buffalo, right? Mm -hmm. So then you look at the city of Buffalo. Um, the city of Buffalo is spending one hundred forty-three million dollars, mm -hmm. so one hundred thirty-eight million dollars more than Amherst. Right. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about a population of 250,000 people. Hmm. Right. 30 yeah. percent of the city's 30 percent of the city's budget. Right. And and and, right. and Buffalo police, you'll, you know it. You live in Buffalo. Right. They have a looming presence that doesn't really resolve anything. No. 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 OK. Any last words, inshallah, you want to uh, leave the audience with uh, Muslims, non-Muslims? I don't know. Like when we when we first spoke, you said that this was kind of about the injustices that occur in America. Um, 
you know, I, I think that a lot of people look at America and see, um, you know, the, the, the freedoms that we have, right? And I think that, you know, as far as the, the, the guarantees that we have, right, the, the, the freedom of speech, right, the freedom to bear arms. The safety that we have. Right? The, the, the freedom to peacefully assemble, right, the freedom of press, like all of these things, like, you know, the, the, the freedoms are what's very uh, attractive to people. And once you become a, a, a U.S. citizen, that you're, you, you're fully tapped in and you have access to all these freedoms, right? Um, but I, I think what people fail to realize is that when you come from a, uh, a brown or black community, um, the, we, we have to continue to struggle to get those freedoms, um, which is not the same thing that you know, everybody's faced with. Um, and, and it really comes down to the, categor the categorization of who you are, right? It's, it's, it's where do you fall ethnically, right? Um, you know, are, are you ethnically Hispanic or not Hispanic? Are, are you black or white or Asian or island, uh, island Pacific or, or, you know, and, and Arab in this country, Arab is considered white, mm. right? And that, that's why Arabs are, are, are fast tracked to citizenship when they move to this country, mm. right? And, and a lot of Arab citizens can't even, Arab American citizens can't even speak English yet because they yeah. haven't been here long enough, but they, yeah. but they get their citizenship in, in, in six or eight months because they're considered to be white, mm. right? Um, so like there, there's, there's so many injustices that occur, um, and 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 like I was saying, it's it's from the the level of unequal spending in the community, um, unequal uh, spending and focus on on uh, education. Um, you're talking about uh, unequal access mm -hmm. to uh, you know post secondary education um, and even scholarships and 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 student loans. Not that we need to get student loans. You're talking about discrimination in housing. Uh, where if an appraiser comes in to look at your house and and he sees people uh -huh. black people on the wall, you know, as far as the pictures on the wall, there's a there's a chance that that appraiser is going to value your house less, um, because it it's it's owned by a black person. Like these are real things that happen in lawsuits that are still happening, right? Redlining, yeah, yeah. saying that banks are not lending in specific, uh, in specific communities because of their uh, ethnic makeup. Um, you know, there's there's two banks in in Buffalo that have been fined with redlining in the past six years. Right. Mm. And this is a practice that we think has ended back in the 60s or 70s. Mm. Right. And we're talking about government programs through FHA and, 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 and HUD um, and and that 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 black and brown people don't don't have equal access to till this day um, mm. when it comes to like self-sufficiency, um, starting a business like uh, the FHA. When you're in projects, when you're in public housing, they're supposed to help you with this. Right. Mm. They help a hell of a lot of white people back in the 60s, 70s and 80s, which is why you don't see white people in the projects today um, at the same rate. Right, but they didn't help black people. They didn't help Hispanic people get connected to these programs, right? Which is why you see us still in, in a higher number and a higher percentage in, in housing projects, right? Um, so it's like, yeah, it, it looks good on the outside, right? And it's not saying that America is not better, you know, uh, in, in terms of safety than a lot of these countries that people are coming from. But mm. when you start to peel back the layers, you really start to see um, that our society is really geared towards uh, a white patriarchy, mm. right? And, and then, and, uh, and in order for this to be successful, the rest of us have to be failing in some sense. As African American Muslims, uh, what percentage of your reason to become Muslim had to do with the issues of justice? I'd say probably like closer to one hundred percent. Like it's uh, like, like everything from racism yeah, is like a big. It's not even the racism thing. It's the accountability uh, component of it. Um, you know, when 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 I'm told that you know, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you're ex, you know expiated for your uh, your sins and, and completely forgiven and given access to heaven, uh, no matter what. Like that to me, like I, I take issue with that because then there's no personal accountability over your actions towards other people or or the things that you do in this world, and and it doesn't. There's no no focus on being a good person. I don't think right. Mm. And Islam is like, you know, there's, there's like six sigma, it's lean. It's like, nobody's perfect, right? We don't ever get to hundred percent. We have to continue to work at it. And even when we're really good, we can still be better. And what like do you that think to me, about, that just makes sense. No, yeah, absolutely. Um, one of my sheikhs, Dr. Islam, he said that African-Americans did not accept Islam because of some philosophical quest. They accepted Islam because of the issue of justice. That's how important it is. You know, and so uh, at least I think it's the, both, though, like, you know, when you when you tap into the black community and and this is, you know, we, we a lot of times like Islam has Islam is so diverse and come to people in so many different ways. 
Mm. Right. And we know that. Um, but when you look at the black community, um, people will generally paint the black community with one broad stroke. Mm. Right. Which is why when you think of black uh, voters, you think of an old black woman that goes to church. Right. Mm. That's your typical black voter. Right. Yeah. But that's not that's not black voters. Right? right. That That's a that's a demographic in the black vote. Mm. Right. And it's like, you know, why did why did black people accept Islam? Like we've got philosophers in in in, in black people. You know what I mean? There, there's people that, that have the philosophical sense. Right. There's people that have the intellectual sense. Um, there's people that that felt, you know, that felt rejuvenated by walking into a masjid. So they, they accepted Islam. There's people that 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 wanted the sense of justice or, you know, maybe they even wanted to just marry some girl. Right. So they, they, they right, took right. Shahada. Right. But I like like I think it's a variety of reasons. But see, um, the, the, I think the point I was trying to make is that especially from African-American history in the last 30, 40 years, they are the largest number of people who have accepted Islam in yeah. really the history. Like you had almost two million people accept Islam right here in America. And that history is kind of like fading away. Which that is also whole, the jail population, two million. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's a, it's the same. And so the other thing I wanted to bring up, uh, last point before we go, is that uh, I wanted to see what your reflections are on this. The first thing the Prophet ﷺ did when he went to Medina, as far as the Muslims are concerned, he built the masjid. The second thing he did, he says, the Prophet said, Don't leave your marketplace only for the Jewish community. And so the Muslims established their own marketplace right near the masjid. And so the Muslims kind of like built their own marketplace, their own trade place that was separate from the Jewish trade place that had been there for a long time. So with the building of the masjid, side by side, there was like an economic infrastructure that was built in. And I really feel that uh, there has not been enough uh, study on that particular issue. And uh, I think that it's a very meaningful thing the prophet did uh, in terms of uh, what he did with the marketplace, creating a separate marketplace away from the Jewish community. And uh, I know that, uh, so what are your reflections about Muslim, uh, or any community that's being oppressed or has the possibility of being oppressed or Muslims for that matter, or African-Americans for that matter, you know, having your own autonomy economically uh, how does that play into all of this? That, that's the epitome of what we have to do as a people, right? Um, and like I already said it, you know, you know, property is, is, is ownership in this country, right? You're not a man unless you own property. And that's essentially what it boils down to. It's like we, we, we have to not only own property because it's the largest uh, wealth builder uh, in this country, um, right? Because it's access to education, uh, it's access to building a business, um, but we actually have to own businesses too, um, and and be self-sustainable in that in that regard, um, because uh, employment is enslavement. Like people don't get that. Like you know the the fact that you have bills, and in order for you to pay your bills, you have to go work for this guy, so he'll give you a check. That's that's enslavement, right? And and we look at slavery like oh you have to be beaten to be a slave and all this other stuff, but Islam has a very different view on slavery, right? And and you know it's 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 a healthy view of of what what it would have been had it not been like corrupted into what it was um because it is it is a part of society even today and then we fail to recognize that but uh you know i i, I <clears throat> with that like you know we have to own businesses and we have to own our houses um and and that that's the only way that we're going to be able to separate financially and then have autonomy um in in the community like yeah. that gives us a voice right businesses make more money than any hourly employment you know, as if, if you go to school to become a, a skilled tradesman in this country, uh, you're going to come out of school making more money than if you go to school to get a master's degree. And we don't talk about that enough. Yeah, we don't. We're especially <laughs> because the immigrants we're... are taught. It took me a long time to get that. Uh, but uh, yeah, you've, you've got a doctorate that... and, and, and you're doing roofing with the rest of us. <laughs> because you recognize There's a hell of a lot more money in actually using your hands. Um, but we're, we're, we're taught to be aristocrats. <laughs> yeah. You know, especially from Pakistan, where my parents were, the, the, the roadmap is go to college, get a job, get married, you know, all that. The, this very specific roadmap that's given to us. And 
my sister is like in, in uh, a nurse that's a uh, what is it the, the 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 practitioner nurse who can write uh, lpn or, or uh yeah she a can nurse write practitioner. Prescription. a nurse yeah yeah she can write prescriptions i mean she's like a doctor right she's the big right? dog but she uh she makes good money but she's in debt because you know she's in debt well and that, so that's part of that's part of what we deal with right is is and this is even a common saying the more you make the more you spend right the more you make the, <laughs> more, the more you, you spend. make the more you're in, you're willing to be in right. debt because when you, you have a when you have a salary of $120,000 you have to have a, a house that reflects your $120,000 salary you have to have a car that reflects your $120,000 salary your kids have to reflect your $120,000 salary your your clothing has to reflect your $120,000 salary like then that, that that's 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 the enslavement right that's the economic oppression and it's like you you look at you know people like Jay-Z and it's funny because Jay-Z you know his 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 claim to wealth you know his struggle to wealth has been in my lifetime Right. Mm -hmm. So we see him from the projects rapping about selling drugs, wearing 10 gold chains to now being a billionaire that doesn't even wear a stitch of gold on his body. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's <laughs> so it's like it's like the uh, it's it, we're delusional. Right. It's it's like, you know, if, if the more we make, the more we have to represent what that is. Uh, two uh, things at a personal note for you. Number one, you are against vaccines, from what I understand. <laughs> <laughs> You don't want to say something about I, that. I, I, I'm I'm not against vaccines. What I'm what I'm against is 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 injecting chemicals into my body. I don't know what it is. Um, you know what I mean. Um, and I'm vaccinated. You know, my kids are partially vaccinated. I believe in researching the vaccines and making sure. Um, you know what you're putting into you doesn't isn't going to have negative health impacts. Um, you know, and and isn't going against what should be going into your body like a lot of the vaccines contain uh, uh um like uh embryonic uh parts and pieces you know which is like you know uh, that's got some problems right where can't cannibalism and in, in injecting you know animal part or, or or human parts into our body is but um in a sense is not like i don't know i'm not i'm not a, i'm not qualified to make these rulings um but also some of them contain gelatin uh which is gonna be derived from pig parts um, which, you know, again, I'm not putting that into my body. I choose not to put that into my body. Um, but mm. I don't know. I, I, then, I, I know you're very, uh, yeah. And then, um, I know you're very strong on, or not for public schools. Muslims should not put their kids in public schools. Um, I don't, I don't know if I'm strong on that. Like I see, and it's been a while since we've had a real conversation, like, cause you know, like my, my thought evolves a bit, you know what I mean? Um, because um part of where we fail is that we uh we separate ourselves from society right mm -hmm. like you know establishing the marketplace is good right educating your kids up to a certain age by muslims only and making sure that they have a large islamic influence in their life is good but i do feel that um that we're doing a disservice to society if we're not putting our kids in in, in public schools um i feel like we're doing a disservice to society if our kids aren't going to college um, because these are the the um, the ways to interact. Obviously, not nobody wants it to be their kid, right? Because if they feel like they're feeding their kid, but like if you have a kid that is that you you know has a strong iman, you know what I mean? That is a leader, and that is gonna you know that is going to be the trailblazer. And people are gonna be following your kid. I, like I I wouldn't see a problem with putting my kid in in public school, and it's about knowing your own kids, you know. But yeah, that's kind of like what kid, my dad did with me. He allowed yeah. me to be in public school, whereas he put my sisters who were uh, compared to me, not as religious, as at least externally, right? And, uh, and so my dad's like, yeah, you can go to public school. <laughs> and then I went. Right. Say, oh, yeah, I've got, I've got two of my kids. I'd be like, okay, I can probably put them in public school and, and I'll, I won't have to worry about too much. But like the rest of my kids, I, I would keep them in a private school uh, situation um, or even a homeschool situation just to cater to them educationally, but also to make sure that their dean is protected, right? Because one of the things I learned is that if, if, if you're having a, a better impact on other people, then it's good for you. But if other people are having a negative impact on you, then it's bad for you. Right. Right. And, and then that's what we have to weigh out. And we can, we can make those decisions consciously, even with our own kids. Right. And it's like, you know, we fail when we write, like if I have my kids asking me to go to public school, right. I might not put them in public school, but maybe I'll take them out of homeschooling and put them in private Islamic schooling, mm -hmm. you yeah. know? Okay. Inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. 
Well, I, agree. Uh, I hope this was beneficial uh, for the Muslims that will listen to this, inshallah. inshallah. Thank you so much. Jazakumullah khairan. It was really hard to get a hold of you, but we did it. Yeah, okay. I've been calling you for like the past two weeks, but we're going to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's not go there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>